And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Mike McKenzie, who during his near-death experience saw Jesus in a very physical form. Mike, thank you for joining me and welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my NDE uh, actually happened right after my oldest son's wedding. Um, we were living in Central California, and he was getting married about five hours south of of our hometown um, in Ventura, California, is on the coast, a real pretty pretty spot. Um, the wedding was going to be on a Saturday, and um, we decided to go down there on Wednesday, spend a little time getting to know her family, and um, so make it a, kind of a short vacation. Uh, we drove down there on Wednesday, uh, checked into the hotel. My boys were into baseball, so they brought some wiffle balls, wiffle bats, and we went out to this big park next to the hotel, and we started playing a little home run derby. Stayed there for a couple hours and ended up coming back to the hotel, got cleaned up, went out to dinner, and I started feeling sick, and I thought, oh, great, you know, great time to get the flu. My son's getting married in a couple of days, and I don't want to be sick. Didn't really think much of it. Uh, next day, Thursday, we... Um, did a little sightseeing with the family and uh, I kept getting sicker and thinking, you know, still thinking I'm getting the flu. And then Friday rolls around and I start running a temperature and Friday we had to get the tuxes. We go out to dinner. Uh, you know, the rehearsal dinner was Friday night. And by this time I'm, I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm really sick. I, my, my fever was running about a hundred and about 101. And I thought something's something's wrong. Maybe it's not the flu. So my son was in the in the medical field. Uh, he's a nuclear medicine technologist, and so we start talking about, hey, what might might be wrong with with dad? You know. Um, so he said, you know, uh, maybe. I mean, it sounds like maybe you got some kind of blockage going on there. You know, when's the last time you were able to go to the bathroom? And I said, you know, gosh, come to think of it. Uh, I haven't been able to go since I've, I mean, I haven't gone since I got here. He says, you know, maybe you should get some laxative or something, you know, get, get yourself cleared out and uh, get ready for the, for the uh, wedding. So uh, Friday night after the rehearsal dinner, um, it was funny because I, I was getting sick and I was talking to a few of the guests there and I said, you know, I'm paying for this dinner. So uh, I'm going to eat my meal and I'm whatever's left on your plate. I'm eating that and I'm having one of every, every kind of dessert that there is, you know, cause I want to get my money's worth. Um, so anyway, Friday night, we get back to the hotel, my son and I, and we're just sitting at the bar having a cocktail and, um, I, you know, we're still trying to figure out what's, what's going on with that. Uh, and, I, I just thought, okay, some, something's not right. You know, maybe it's not the flu, but we're still trying to guess what's going on. Uh, so Friday night, he goes back to his place. I go up to the room and I couldn't sleep. And so about two o'clock in the morning, I still haven't slept at all. I thought I'm going to go get something for the pain because now my stomach's hurting pretty bad. I went to the quick stop, got some Tylenol, got some laxative. It said, you know, it works in two hours. Or it could take up to 24 hours, but um, I thought, you know, two hours would be great. Get me cleaned out. You know, everything's going to be great. I'll go to the wedding. Everything will be fine. Well, nothing happened. So that the night before the wedding, I, I didn't sleep one wink. I mean, next day we get up. I'm looking pale. I'm running a fever still. Now I'm up to about 102. My stomach hurts. Still didn't know what was wrong with me, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to tough it out with the wedding. So we go through the wedding. The wedding was beautiful. It was at a golf course there in Ventura. You know, the, the weather was perfect. I mean, it was just a beautiful wedding. And after everything was kind of winding down, they did the reception. Um, my wife says, or his wife says, you know, we're going to go over to my parents' house. They have this beautiful condo that overlooks the ocean. They were going to take their presents over there and open them up and keep the party going. And I said, guys, I got to go get checked out. So my son being in the medical field said, Hey, go to this hospital, go to the ER, they'll get you checked out. So I did. I walked in. Um, my wife took me 
And we sit down in the waiting room and I'm just miserable. I mean, I haven't slept in 24 hours. I'm, I'm sweating bullets. I'm, my stomach hurts, but I'm still thinking I got the flu. So they call me back. They do all these tests. They take blood tests. And she comes back, the nurse comes back and she says, you know, I think, uh, I think you have appendicitis. And I said, no, 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 I, I just have the flu. Right. <laughs> Uh, she says, no, I, I'm pretty sure you have appendicitis. And she says, lay down on this table. So she takes a hammer, one of those little steel hammers, like they knock your, your knee with to check your reflexes. And she taps the bottom of my foot and she says, does that, does that hurt? And I said, no, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking I get the flu. What's wrong with you people? And she taps the other foot and man, the pain sent me through the roof. I actually screamed. And she says, yeah, that's your appendix. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's probably ruptured. And she gets the test results back. And my white blood cell count was super high. She says, I'm going to call in uh, a surgeon. So she calls him in. He comes in probably, I don't know, half an hour later. He says, yeah, he's kind of pushing on my abdomen. He says, I think it's probably a ruptured appendix. And I'm still telling him, no, I, I you guys are wrong. I, stay, I think really I have the flu and maybe... Maybe I just need to go to the bathroom, you know, tell them I took the laxative. And <laughs> he's kind of laughing at me. He says, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll get in there and we'll check it out. So they wheel me into the emergency room or into the, uh, the surgical room. They lay me on the table. As soon as they put the mask on my face, I'm out. And the next thing I know, Jesus is standing next to me in a white robe. And he holds out his hand and he says, I want to answer your prayer. And my mind is racing. I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> Jesus is here. What the heck is going on? Am I dead? Uh, and I thought, I thought, wait, I was at, I was at my son's wedding and then, uh, I was having surgery and, and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I think I'm dead. But then I thought, you know, all these, these people that say they have these NDEs, they float away from their bodies. And I thought, well, I didn't float away. So I'm, I must still be in my body. It must be okay. But here's Jesus standing here holding out his hand. And when he said, I want to answer your prayer, I was like, what the heck is going on here? So I take his hand. As soon as I do, we are both standing on top of this mountain. I look down at my feet. There's like dark green grass beneath my feet. I'm barefoot. And my senses were heightened to the point where I could count every blade of grass beneath my feet. And I thought, this is the, the weirdest thing. Everything in front of me was white. Everything all around me was like super white. It was almost like, like fog. It felt like, like a warm mist, but it was so bright. It was blinding. And then off to my right, uh, is this, this light orb. It's, it's probably the size of a basketball, but it's way off in the distance and it's even wider than everything else. So it kind of shines uh, and it, and it's bright. And I look at it and I think, man, that's weird, you know, and I'm still holding Jesus' hand. And all of a sudden, these light beams start coming out from this thing towards me. They're almost like, um, like fluorescent tubes, lighting tubes. They were about two feet long. They were a little bit wider, uh, or a little bit bigger around than a fluorescent tube. And uh, they, and one by one, slowly, they just start zipping by my, my head. And then one of them's coming right at my head. And I thought, should I duck? I mean, wh what's going to happen? It hits me in the forehead. And as it hits me, it makes kind of a buzzing sound and it slows down. But the heat from this thing warmed my entire body. And I thought, man, this is the craziest thing. And then all of a sudden, the white, the bright white that was the, that is the fog that's kind of enveloping me, gets pulled from my right to my left. So it kind of goes right in front of me and it opens up like somebody's drawing a curtain. And now I see that I am on a mountain. There's, a, there's below me, there's the bottom of this mountain. There's a valley below. The fog kind of settles into the valley. And then on the other side, there's another mountain that goes up this way. And off in the distance on that mountain, I see all these trees. They look like pine trees. They were kind of cone-shaped, pretty tall. And um, the light 
the the light beams that are coming at me from all from this from this light orb start going in that direction too it's like they're going these these tubes are going everywhere and one of them hits the tip of a tree of of the the, the pine trees or whatever the cone the cone shaped trees and it's like it had a diamond on the tip of of the branch and when that light hit that diamond it shot into like like hundreds of little light beams so now these things are flying everywhere these little light beams and above the trees are these colors of the sky that can almost i mean it was like a beautiful sunset but it was more vivid um almost like neon colors and it was orange yellow at the bottom and then as it got darker it was like brighter blues and purples and uh, there were a few wispy little uh, uh, flowers on the hill in front of me. And then as I'm looking at these flowers, I look down and there's where the fog had settled in the valley between the two hills, the one I'm on and the one out in, in the distance, uh, there's a city down there. And there's a couple of like building tops sticking up. I can't see anything because the fog kind of sat like right on the on on top of the buildings but there's these tall like domes and there's a few spires you know real tall buildings that are kind of sticking up and most of them are white but there was a couple of gold ones and as these as the light beams are still flashing all over the place there's little white lights going everywhere i look back at the light source where they were coming from and when i look back at it jesus says to me it's the glory of the lord and when he said that, uh, I just got so weak in my knees, I fell to my knees. And when my knees hit the ground, they shocked me and brought me back. And all of a sudden, I opened my eyes, and I'm looking up, and there's a doctor with a mask on. And he's leaning over me, and he says, do you know your name? And I answered him, but I answered him in my mind. I said, Mike. And he, and he looks at me again, and he says, do you know your name? And I thought, oh, I, I thought I answered him, but I didn't open my mouth. I'm just, you know, talking in my mind. And so I opened my mouth to talk, and I'm my throat's really super dry, and it's all crackly, and it comes out as Mike. <laughs> and he says, he says, oh, good. Do you know where you are? And it took me a second. I thought I had to think. Okay, <laughs> I think I was just in heaven. But I'm obviously not there now, so I must be in Ventura. So I said, Ventura. And doctor looks around at everybody else in the room, and that's when I realize there's like five or six people in the room. He looks around and he says, okay, he's back. And uh, there's a couple of nurses. They're wearing scrubs. This one nurse comes by, kind of pats me on the, on the leg and says, hey, take care, you know, something like that. And they walked out. And um, he says, let's get them to ICU. So they wheeled me up to my room uh, in ICU. And uh, eventually I fell asleep uh, in, in the room, woke up a couple hours later, and uh, there's a nurse sitting next to me. And, she, you know, I, I, I tried to talk to her, but I had a tough time talking because my mouth was just so dry, probably from the I don't know, anesthesia or something. And um, man, I was just like, like so confused, like, like what the heck is going on? You know, I, I, I think I, I think I died, but you know, now I'm back and I'm thinking, I, I just had a near death experience. And, um, I had a hard time breathing and I, I told the nurse when I could finally talk, I was so weak. I could, I, my hands were folded on my chest and I couldn't really lift them off my chest. I was just so weak. I said, hey, I, I'm having a really hard time breathing here. And she takes the stethoscope and she listens and she says, oh, honey, you're developing pneumonia. And I thought, oh, man, I mean, if I if I get pneumonia with as weak as I am, if I can't lift my hands, I thought if I get pneumonia, I'm going to die. Uh, there's no way I'm going to make it. And so she calls somebody in. They bring in. And she took my temperature and she said, oh, you're at 104.5 or whatever, 104 something. 
And so they brought in this ice pack. They packed me in ice. They gave me this thing. She called it a spirometer. She said, it's a, like a little like a little tube with a marble in it with a little, um, almost like a straw that fits into your mouth. And she says, I want you to blow into this straw and get this little marble to move to to the number five. And on the on the tube, there's zero, one, two, three, all the way to 10. She says, I need you to blow on it till you can get it up to five. And she says, can you hold it? And I said, I can't even move my hands. So she takes it and she tucks it in my hands and she sets it on my chest. She puts the thing in my mouth. She says, can you blow? And so I tried blowing. And of course, the marble didn't move at all. I mean, it just stuck. Um, so I, I kept working on that. And it took about three hours to where I could get the marble to finally move. I got it up to five. And she checked my lungs. She says, okay, I, I think we're out of the woods. So you're going to, you're going to be okay. Um, but I spent, uh, four days in ICU and they moved me back down to a regular room. I spent another, uh, well, I spent a total of 12 days there. I, um, I developed an abscess. My, my appendix were ruptured, but I developed an abscess, which, you know, the, the germs kind of uh, they all group together and they try and finish you off basically. Um, so that, that kind of kept me in, in the hospital for a little bit longer. The surgeon came in to see me the next day and he says, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see you're still here. I, I heard we had a little episode last night and I said, yeah. And he says, um, he says, you know, you know, he's, he's checking out my abdomen and he says, I got to tell you, that was probably the worst case I've ever seen. And this is an old guy. He had to be 70 years old when he was working on me. And he says, I, uh, when I got in there, he said, I thought I was working on a dead man. And he says, uh, you're obviously, God's not done with you. And I said, well, thanks for saving my life. And he walks out and then he comes back in. He says, you know, uh, I said it was the worst case I've ever seen, but that wasn't exactly true. He said, but yours is the worst case where my patient has lived. And he says, so congrats. And, you know, whatever you're supposed to do here on earth, I, I hope you, I hope you, uh, you know, make, make the big man happy. <laughs> he was a really cool old, old, old guy, that, uh, old surgeon. Um, and uh, so the next day, my wife came in to see me after surgery. And she says, um, how are you feeling? You know, she sits down and I tried to tell her what, it, what happened and, you know, about my NDE. And I opened up my mouth to talk to her and I said, I got, I got to tell you this, you're not going to believe it. And I tried to tell her and I just started crying. And she's, she's like, you know, it's okay. Don't, you know, don't, don't worry. You can tell me later. And so I, it took me like till three days from then that I could finally tell her what happened because it was just so emotional. Um, and then a lot of reflection after that, like when Jesus came to me, he said, I want to answer your prayer. I thought my prayer, you know, what, what is he talking about? You know, as I'm thinking back uh, about what happened, I remember as a kid, like my grandfather died when I was about probably nine or 10. And I remember going to his funeral and everybody said, you know, grandpa's in heaven now, he's in a better place. And it's just kind of when I was starting to learn about religion and God and, you know, and I, and I, I remember I started praying as a kid, you know, God, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that needs to take apart the watch to see the gears and the springs to know how it works. You're asking me to just swallow this heaven thing. And I don't even know anything about it. So could you show me? You know, and I remember praying that as a little kid for a long time. And uh, about 40 years later, he decided to answer me. Mike, thanks for sharing your experience with us. When you first encountered Jesus, were you in a laying down position like you were on the operating table? Or were you sitting up or standing? I was laying in bed uh, at, in a hospital gown. It just, I mean, it was like, I went from the surgery table to a bed somehow. I have no idea. Uh, you know, that must have happened when I was out. But yeah, I was laying down. And 
and I, I just kind of looked over and I thought, okay, what's going on? Did you actually die during surgery? Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked me that. I, I don't know what happened. I know that they shocked me because I, I saw the, the, the crash cart and I saw the, the handles were kind of a disarray and there was, you know, the, the little cords that go to them kind of laying there. It wasn't like it was ready to go. It was like it had been used. And when I saw that, I'll tell you what, I got really scared and I thought, uh, they, you know, they, they must have used that because I know when my knees hit the ground, I felt something. Um, but it scared me so bad that I didn't even want to know. Hmm. I never, I never asked them, you know, how long was I out or what happened? Uh, I just know they had to shock me and bring me back. What did Jesus look like? He looked different than the Jesus that I had always been shown as a kid growing up. He wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't Caucasian. He was dark. I mean, he was, he looked like an Arab man. Um, he had dark hair, um, darker than I'd ever seen. It was just past his shoulders. Um, I'll never forget the blue eyes, the, the greenish blue eyes that looked, when he looked in my eyes, he didn't just look at me like, like we look at each other. He looked into my soul. I mean, that was kind of the, the clue that I knew that this is Jesus, you know? So he did, he did look very different. Did he ever say, Mike, I'm Jesus, or did you just kind of have a knowing of that? I knew it. I knew it from from the minute he from the minute I laid eyes on him. I knew it. If you can remember that city, and I know you couldn't see a lot of it because of the fog, did it look futuristic or anything like that? Or did it look like it would not be a city from Earth? It didn't have uh anything strange to, I mean, it, it didn't look like, um, you know, something from the future. It didn't look like anything from the past either. It looked like, um, it looked like the, the big dome that I saw that it looked like a capital dome. It was gold. There were a couple of other smaller ones. Uh, but then there were like, like square pointy ones, you know, like real tall spires. And, Something that I realized a few years later, I thought, you know, a lot of times, like on a, like on a steeple on a church, they'll have uh, uh, like a, a cross at the top. There were no crosses there. It was just, you know, just a, a, a sharp point at the top of a building. Do you feel like that was heaven or yeah. a city in heaven? I, I think so. Yeah. I think I saw a city in heaven. I don't know why, you know, I couldn't see any more, maybe because... Uh, you know, I wasn't dead. I wasn't supposed to be there. I don't know. I think it was just Jesus saying, "Hey, here's a here's my chance to answer your prayer as a kid," mm -hmm. and you know, and I think it you know it's going to take me a little while to figure it all out. Um, but uh, you know, the other thing that I used to pray about too, when he said it's the glory of the Lord, and it had that reaction that that I had that reaction to it. Uh, I remember as a kid watching Charlie Brown Christmas. And the part that always really got me was uh, Linus comes out on the stage and everything gets quiet and he, he talks, you know, he says, the glory of the Lord shown all around them. And I used to think, man, what, what is the glory of, if, he, if the Bible is saying the glory of the Lord, what must that look like? That must be really cool because this is God of the universe. God made everything that I know, everything that I see. What must his glory look like? And I just was always fascinated with that. And so when he said it's the glory of the Lord, it just had that, re I had that reaction. I just couldn't stand. Did you tell that surgeon about your NDE? No, I couldn't. I, I, I told uh, a nurse later, uh, it was in my regular room. I, di I didn't tell anybody uh, as uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, what do you call it? <laughs> uh, anyway, in, I can't even think of what the word I'm trying to say. Um, but I, I waited till I got back to the regular, the regular room on the regular floors and I was reading a Bible. So uh, a friend of ours came by 
to see me in the hospital and they they brought me a bible and they said you know you don't want to be here without reading the word of god and you know it was a friend of ours from church and so i was reading the bible uh one day and this nurse walked in and she says she says oh are you are you a christian i said yeah she says uh man i don't know how some people can be in here without him or something like that and i said man i, I got a story for you and she says really and I said, yeah, I think I had an NDE. And she goes, oh, wow. And I and I kind of told her a little bit about it. I said, you know, Jesus was standing next to me. And I kind of downplayed the whole thing. You know, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. Um, but I was also afraid that, you know, if I told her the whole thing, that I'd start crying again. Because every time I tell somebody, I'd, I'd just bawl my eyes out. And um, uh, so that was the only time that I told anybody in the hospital besides family members about what had happened. Do you think that you start crying because you have this overwhelming feel of love? I think most definitely. I just was just in awe of the, the love that I felt from Jesus was, was one thing, but the, the, just the overwhelming uh, presence, you know, it, the, Jesus presence the the holiness and the whole, and the fact that I was just I was so humbled because he's answering a prayer that I prayed as a kid I mean I was I think 42 years old uh, you know it was just it was just like wow you know you, it, it, one day is like a thousand years for you you know you waited this long and you're answering a prayer I didn't think it was that big of a deal but I I, I remember praying it a lot you know uh, as a kid. Um, so I think it was the love and just the, it just, it just overwhelmed me, you know, just got to me still does. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell the story and, and I'll start tearing up at certain times, you know, especially when I think of the glory of the Lord and, and the, the light that I saw, I just think, wow, it was just amazing. You are already a Christian at the time this happened. Did it change your religious beliefs in any way? Mm, I I don't think it changed me. I mean, I wasn't, um, you know, some people will, will say, you know, that he's on fire for Jesus or, you know, he's, I, I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't somebody that went to church more than uh, once or twice a month, you know? It didn't, I didn't have, uh, I don't think, a real connection with God. Um, and maybe that was part of the purpose. Uh, it, it didn't change my belief. I mean, I've always believed in God. Um, but I think it made me hungry for more. You know, like, like I thought, you know, people say they have a relationship with Jesus. And I think, I think, uh, I don't know if I really did, you know, but I sure do now. <laughs> after that, I thought, wow, if he cares about me that much, you know, who am I, you know? So, yeah, I, th I think it strengthened my, my relationship with Jesus for sure. What do you think your general purpose or your purpose for coming back is? I think um, when I was in the hospital, I, I started taking notes because I thought, you know, I, I need to remember what happened here and, and I have a terrible memory anyway. Uh, so I asked my wife to get me a notepad. And when I was strong enough to hold the pen, uh, I started jotting down notes. And part of that was because I had, uh, when I got a roommate, he was just hilarious. The guy was just cracking me up all the time. So I thought, I got to remember this, all this stuff. So I'm writing notes all the time. And I remember talking to God one day and saying, okay, I need to go back and tell people about this experience to, to give them hope. Because, you know, if, if you care that much about me. I know you care about everybody. And I thought I need to, I need to share this experience with as many people as possible. So I think that was really the, the purpose. And as I kind of worked through that, the nurse that I told the NDE about, I talked to her one time and I said, Hey, if I, if I put together like a little brochure and said, you know, you, you know, I told about the hope that I, that I had and, and the things that I went through, just put together a little brochure. Could I come back and talk to people about it and talk to patients? She says, Oh yeah, they, they'd let you do that. And we'd love that, you know? So, um, 
I start. That's when I, you know, I thought I got to remember this stuff, so I'll write it all down. And then um, the brochure kind of became more of a. I thought I need to be able to expound on this a little bit and and let people know that it was such a physical thing that I went through. It, you know, and when I got out of the hospital, I I started researching all these NDEs and. And I remember people floating and doing it, you know, like I said, floating away from their bodies. And I thought, man, that wasn't like mine at all. Mine was physical. So I came up with an idea for a book and I just started writing a book. I ended up um, writing a, a fiction novel because I made it as the NDE part, the hospital part, all that stuff was real. But then I kind of twisted it into it a little scientific kind of a, you know, a way for me to show that I think heaven actually could be a real physical place. Like right now, like, you know, God, God has hidden things from us in this day and age. And I think what if heaven's out there and, and it's a real physical place and he just hid it from us now. And I, and so I started, like, I would re research the Bible and I would look at it and I'd say, okay, well, when Jesus, when, when Stephen was stoned to death, he looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus. He didn't see Jesus floating. He saw Jesus sitting. That's a physical property. And there's other things in the Bible that tell, you know, about physical properties of, of heaven. And so I came up with the idea. Um, I ended up publishing the book. The book did, did really well. It's 10 years old now. Um, but it was, uh, it was just my way of kind of giving people hope. And I actually had people... Uh, message me through my Facebook page and say, Hey, I read your book. And, you know, there's this part where your character uh, becomes a Christian and I prayed the prayer. And does that mean I'm a Christian now too? And I'm like, well, you know, it's between you and God, but <laughs> I'd say you're, you, you know, you're well on your way. So go get baptized and, and make it real. <laughs> Do you think that heaven and the realm you were in with Jesus is just as real as here, but like it's in another dimension or another frequency, just like changing the radio dial when you get from one station to another. That is, that is my theory. Yeah. I think there's enough clues in the Bible to tell us that, that heaven is a physical place right now. And I think it's, you know, you, you, you go there, you can get a temporary body, you know, we're, we're, I mean, me without a body, it would be pretty weird. You know, I, I, I believe there's a spirit there uh, that is not going to die. And I think that spirit would be lost without a body. So never know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to getting the mystery solved. Mm -hmm. I did have another another friend that and this kind of fed my curiosity. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was a painting contractor. And he was working at the house of uh, Robert Conrad, the actor. And I went up there and I I was selling him paint at the time. And so I went up there and I, I brought him some paint and he ended up falling off the roof and he fell 30 feet onto his head. They had to life flight him to Modesto, which is the closest town to uh, where Bob's house was. And um, he later told me, he said, you know, I, I think I had a near death experience. He said, I looked at him from from the bedroom, the third floor, and he was all bloody on the on the ground. And I'm yelling for Bob, the, the actor. I was like, Bob, you know, Larry just fell off your roof. We need to call nine one one. And he says, Call nine one one. And I'm saying, well, What's your address? You know, I don't know your address. And he says, Just tell him it's my house. And so anyway, they brought him out. Uh, they brought him down. He lived, and it, it was touch and go for a while. But he later told me he said. I think I had an NDE because uh, I was, I found myself in this tunnel and I was going through this tunnel and I didn't have arms and legs and I was getting kind of seasick. It was like I was on a skateboard, but he said, there's all these lights sipping by me like real fast. And so after my NDE, I thought, I wonder if that was stars he was going by, you know, like God's sucking him through this wormhole to somewhere, you know, he's on his way to heaven. And then he said that Bob grabbed his hand. And when he grabbed his hand, that pulled him back out of the tunnel and, and it kept him from going further. And I thought, wow, that, what if those were stars that he was zipping through, you know? So a lot of unanswered stuff that 
you know, just, we're just curious beings. And I don't know. Since you are kind of looking forward to solving the mystery, <laughs> I would assume that you don't fear death. No. No. I mean, I'm not, I, 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 I describe it like this, like death is like moving. I don't look forward to the process, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the destination. So that's my take on it now. Has the memories of the experience faded over time? Uh, somewhat. I mean, they, they, they come back. Like when I, when I'm telling people about it, it'll, it'll come back and I'll think, oh yeah, there was, there was that, or there was that. But I've told the story so many times now that, um, that I think I've, I've got the details pretty well. I, I don't think I've forgotten anything. Um, but that, that took a while. I mean, it, it, it would come back to me, you know, as I'm telling the story, I would think, oh yeah, there was this and there was this. And, you know, after a couple months, I think I remembered it all. And then I would write, I would write it all, all down. Did you notice after your experience that you had any new gifts or abilities that you didn't have prior? No, I wouldn't say gifts or abilities, but I did have uh, an appreciation for for this world. Um, I was in a pretty stressful job when this happened. Uh, I was a superintendent for a real estate development company, and there was a lot of pressure to get the houses built. Uh, I was under a lot of stress, plus I was building my own house at the time. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, I was raising three boys and a, and a girl. They were all in sports. So I would come home from work. I would throw stuff into my truck and I would go out and I coached the kids in baseball and football and, you know, all that stuff. So I was just going, going, going. You know, we just didn't have any days off. And baseball back then i mean it's like it is now it's it's 24 7 it's you know there's the it used to be baseball season now it's baseball season and then baseball season is fall ball and then there's winter ball and then there's you know traveling teams and you just always going and going and there's tournaments all over the place it's crazy um so i just felt like i was in this pattern of uh just go 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 uh, I didn't, I didn't stop and smell the roses, you know, to use a cliche. And I think after that, uh, I did, I, I, I forced myself to slow down. I, I looked at, like, I looked at trees differently. I looked at sunsets differently. I looked at my dog differently. You know, I just thought, you know, just take it all in and just slow down. I remember, um, uh, it kind of hit me as I was, as I got my strength back, they always want you to to walk in in the hospital when you're in, in the hospital they always walking's a big deal so you get up you got your your all these bags hanging from the pole and poles on wheels and you got your iv bags and drain bags and i had tubes in things that i didn't think they could put tubes in and so i would walk down the halls and i remember looking at the at the pictures on the walls and there were beautiful like forest pictures and pictures of the ocean and then I just remember looking at it thinking, man, what, what am I missing? You know, I'm, I, I, if this was old Mike, he would just walk right by those pictures, not even look at them. And I would just stand there and look at them for hours and just think this is, I'm, I'm going too fast and too hard. I got, I got to slow down. And there, and it was in a beautiful town. Ventura is beautiful. It's right on the sit on the ocean. And, um, I would go down to, like when I was cold, I I learned where the warm waiting room areas were. I would push my little stand with the bags on it, and I would go sit in the, in the warm area, and I would look out the windows and just look at the ocean and think, man, it's just there's just so much beauty here. I just got to slow down and just take it all in. So that's that definitely changed me. If you had a friend that just lost somebody and was grieving or suffering, what kind of advice would you give? Man, I would say, don't worry about them. You know, you always hear, to use another cliche, you always hear they're in a better place. And it's hard to imagine because people see the body go into a casket and the casket go in the ground and that's it. Uh, but that's not it. I mean, th there's there's life after death. 
And I would just say they are, are in a better place, a much better place. You have no idea. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Oh, sure. What's the yeah. best way to contact you? I think the best way is uh, to find my Facebook page uh, for the book that I wrote is Accidental Heaven. Um, I, I can show you a picture of it. That's the book that I wrote. That's the, the fictional book. Um, and that, that's the one where it's a fictional story so that I could tell about um, uh, a physical heaven. Um, all the hospital stuff is all real. Uh, there's that, that was all nonfiction. Um, there's some, some of the funny stories about my, the, my roommate. It guy just cracked me up. Uh, I still think of that guy and I just, I just smile, you know? And so, yeah, the best way to get a hold of me is to find Facebook accidental heaven. Or, yeah. I'll take all, any questions they they got for me. If people want to learn more about your book, should they find it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. Um, and then I had, uh, I had guideposts. Um, it's a Christian publishing company. They reached out to me about a year ago and they, they read the book and they said, you know, it sounds interesting. And I've heard you say that it's, that it's real. We'd like to talk to you about your NDE. They had one of their writers um, contact me, and over the course of about six months, I told her all the stuff um, that happened in the NDE. They, I told her about my life, and they basically wrote my life story leading up to the NDE and, and changes that have come after that. Um, but that's in their their um, Witnessing Heaven series. It's called Glimpses of Eternity. Mine and three other NDE stories are in there. Pretty interesting book. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Uh, well, a couple of them. Uh, have faith that there is life after death. Um, and whatever you're doing, and I know it's a it's kind of a big thing now. I read a lot of stuff on, you know, you, you read memes that say, hey, slow down, do this, you know, enjoy the moment and all that. Um, man, just, it's just, Live in the moment. It sounds cliched again, but live in the moment. Take in every minute you have and just enjoy family. Um, don't sweat the small stuff, you know, just enjoy life. Mike, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.